In this video, we're going to now talk about the first compound form, which is minuet and trio. So a compound form is a combination of two or more simple forms. And you'll remember that simple forms is another word or another term uh, for those forms that we've called song forms. So a minuet is a type of dance that was a holdover from the Baroque suite. And in the classical era, the minuet and trio form emerges, which is associated with the third movement of sonata cycle works, such as symphonies, uh, chamber music, uh, solo sonatas, and so forth. So, um, being a dance form, it has certain characteristics of meter and tempo. Um, so you expect it to be a triple meter and 3-4. And you also would look for a moderate tempo. And then you you can also say that with the classical minuet, that it expresses a sense of self-imposed res restraint. So the minuet would be coupled then with a trio. And the trio section is a section that forms a sense of contrast. So it has the same triple meter, the same moderate tempo, the same idea of self-imposed restraint, so it doesn't have contrast with those basic qualities of the minuet. But you expect the trio to be in in a different key to have a contrasting texture and so the term trio initially was used by Lully, and it referred to these passages where the number of players reduced to three. And so in an orchestral work, you'll look for a reduction in the number of players at the beginning of the trio section. So you can find other textural contrasts with the use of things like um, homophonic texture in the minuet, polyphonic imitative texture in a trio, or vice versa. We'll see some examples where this is polyphonic and this is uh, more homophonic. And then of course you would have contrasting themes. So really this idea of minuet and trio which then at the end of the trio section, you expect to see a da capo indicated, which meant to go back and replay the minuet. The performance practice is that on that da capo, to not take repeats. And so that would be played without repeat. And so overall, it's an ABA, with the B section being the trio section. All right, so what you're going to see as far as the form within the minuet and the trio is you're going to look for enlarged three-part song form. So 
we've talked about that. You've done some analysis with those enlarged three-part song form structures. I'll map that out here in just one minute, but you'll look for that as the, the first thing that you're expecting. Now, you can find examples where it doesn't do that, uh, but the vast majority of them do. And in the trio as well, that also you're looking for enlarged three-part song form. So, um, that's where we're going to start with this. So, you should be able to talk about the way a trio forms a sense of contrast with the minuet and to talk about these basic characteristics of the minuet, which also are reflected in the trio. But it's these elements that are different. They both have enlarged three-part song form as the general expected song form within each. All right, so, what we're gonna see in the way that, I'm just gonna put, large three-part song form. What you're going to expect is to have part one. Typically, it will have double bars and repeats. And you would expect it to be like a typical enlarged three-part song form in that this is not longer than a uh, double period in length. So not particularly long in these parts. If it's in a minor key, then you could look to see if it goes to relative major. This is the set instead. You can find, you know, part ones that don't cadence on the dominant, that would just have a cadence and tonic, you know, not have a, a sense of, you know, shifting key. A lot of times this will be uh, a period construction, so two phrases, but we'll see some variety there. But at any rate, that is a close with double bars and repeats. Part two, then begins after the double bars and repeats, and so whatever key this has gotten to at the end of the first part, then that typically is where it picks it up at the beginning of part two, and this will sequence, you'll have you know, a couple of phrases usually, at the very end of part two, you can look, whether it's in a minor key or a major key, for a final arrival on, on the dominant harmony, which prepares then that return of the part one material, so you remember that part one and part three share the same material. And then this will cadence in time. And that would then be repeated. So this is the basic plan that you look for. You don't particularly have to look for contrasting theme with part two. Very often it's the same thematic atmosphere, it's the same character. Um, and so there's not a lot of thematic contrast within the minuet. But this is the overall tonal architecture of this um, part of the movement. And so you're going to find exactly the same setup for the trio section. So the trio then um, is, and you look for this same construction, and at the end of that would be the da capo. So you look to see if that is included in the, uh, you know, in the score. Sometimes a composer will not write da capo, but instead will write out 
the repeat of the minuet. And so when that happens, there's usually a reason for it. So if you remember back on the scherzo movement of the Beethoven Fifth Symphony, instead of having a da capo at the end of the trio section of the third movement, he writes out that restatement of the scherzo, and he does it so that he can change the dynamic level to pianissimo, and also changes the articulation to uh, you know, pizzicato for the strings, so staccato, detached, and it really changes the character of that opening uh, scherzo movement. So whenever you see that happen, you want to try to come up with a reason why the composer would do that. Otherwise, they would just write da capo, and would just have that, that literal uh, repeat of the minuet or repeat of the scherzo. Uh, and of course, it's played that repeats is what you expect as far as not taking these repeat signs on that da capo. Okay, so that's the, the general plan that you're going to look for in these. And so, one of the things that we find with Beethoven is that Beethoven begins to write scarce movements instead of minuet and trio movements. In general, scherzo movements have more of an emotional element as compared to that sense of you know, repose and, and restraint that you find in the classical minuet. So, in the scherzo that it is a faster tempo. As compared to the minuet, which is a moderate tempo. And that there's a greater sense of emotional expression in the scherzo. So the term scherzo itself means a joke. So if it's in a major key, it can have a, a lighthearted or a comical or even an ironic, you know, having the idea of the unexpected, but something that's uh, a little bit more, you know, playful and humorous. So, And that's in contrast to that sense of um, intentional emotional restraint. So if it's in a major key, you can look for that, something that's light, that's um, you know, comical. If it's in a minor key, then you can expect that it will be more dramatic. And that, of course, is in contrast to that sense of emotional restraint in the classical minuet. So those are the two main differences, are the tempo and then the mood, the atmosphere. And so you can look for that in um, just being able to describe things that you're, that you're going to expect to hear all right, now, with the Beethoven scherzos that we're going to look at, And um, it's not that he wrote every third movement of a you know, piano sonata um, in scherzo 
trio form, because there are some that are minuet trio, but the majority of scherzo trio, and the like, you know, majority of the string quartets and symphonies, he's writing scherzo movements for the symphonies. Um, so things that you can look for are this further sense of contrast by, he would couple a minor scherzo, which would be more dramatic, with a trio that was in the major mode. So you have this contrast of mode as well. And so associated with that were these characteristics I just talked about with minor being dramatic and major being something that um, is more comical. And so you'll look for that, and I'll put here, and vice versa, that he would couple a major scherzo with a minor trio. And so as far as the key, um, he could use something like, you know, the relative minor um, or the parallel minor and, and vice versa. Um, and you can find even further kind of uh, relationships there. But that idea of minor and major, he, he would play off those ideas in his scherzo trio movements. So what we're going to do is to look at um, an example of a classical minuetted trio movement. Uh, we're going to look at one of the movements of the Mozart piano sonatas, uh, Kershaw 331 uh, in A major. And then um, you're, we're going to take uh, four different Beethoven um, minuetted trio or scherzo trio movements and then I'll have you uh, complete some worksheets on those um, and you'll analyze those using these basic forms that you're looking for. Um, so um, we will stop there on this section and uh, next are going to be looking at that Mozart minuet trio.